Thank you, Senator Paul. And thank, thanks to all of you who uh, braved the weather this morning uh, to come out to meet with us. It's very gratifying to look out into this crowd and see so many people. Uh, just like people that I've seen throughout the state of Utah, I see so many of you who love things that are distinctively and uniquely American. This, you see, is what the Tea Party is all about. There is a lot of misunderstanding as to what the Tea Party movement is. Some call it a party, others call it new. Some call it radical. Uh, I think it's none of those things. In fact, it's something that, in its essence, has been around for a couple of centuries. The original Tea Partiers were the classic Americans. They were the people who showed up. They showed up just like you showed up today. But they, they showed up in December of 1773 to protest something that uh, you also feel passionately about in, in, in many of the same ways. They showed up to protest against a large, distant national government that was taxing the people too much that was regulating the people oppressively, that operated so far from the people that it was slow to respond to the needs of the people. And so they spoke, they spoke loud and clear about what they did not want out of their national government. Now it's interesting how it evolved from there. It took them 14 years to get from the Boston Tea Party in 1773 to Philadelphia in 1787 where that same movement, or the progression of that same movement, arrived at a conclusion about what they did want out of their national government. The interesting thing is, what they did want out of their national government is something they put into a document that's still around today. It still holds many of the same answers, doesn't it? Amen. Mm -hmm. We've amended it a few times. And what this document says is, you know, so as to avoid some of the problems that we faced with our old national government, I mean our really old one, going back to the 1700s, the one based in London, we're going to put together a national government this time that has just a few powers. We're going to reserve most government power to the states, because it's states where governments operate closer to the people. How many of you know your state legislator? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I know mine as well. I, I run into him at the grocery store all the time. He knows I'm going to run into him at the grocery store all the time. And if he does something that I disagree with, he knows that we're going to have a good chat about that at the grocery store or at the baseball field or elsewhere. It doesn't work quite the same at the national level. The founding fathers understood that. They also understood that there is a certain tendency with large, distant, national, centralized governments uh, toward not respecting individual liberty and property in the same way that that can be achieved at the state and the local level. So what they said is, our national government needs to exist. We have to have a national government. We're going to give it a few powers. It will be in charge of those powers. It, it will be uh, completely in charge of those powers. And those powers include distinctively national government functions, like national defense, like regulating trade between the states and with foreign countries, like establishing a uniform system of weights and measures, coining money, declaring war, managing federal property. And then there's my personal favorite power of Congress, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. It's a term we don't use very often these days, although we do in my house. Uh, uh, just <laughs> a letter of mark and reprisal is basically a hall pass issued by Congress that enables you or anyone who receives it to engage in state-sponsored acts of piracy on the high seas in the name of the United States government. <laughs> My twin boys are fascinated with this power, and they've asked that now that their dad is a United States Senator, if one day they can be granted a letter of mark. <laughs> <laughs> we in the Lee family are going to purchase a pirate ship with a pirate flag, uh, and, and someday I'll get that letter of mark and reprisal. You're all invited to join me on that ship. <laughs> Section 8. It's one that we need to pay careful attention to. With only a few exceptions, almost all of the powers that the federal government has can be found in Article 1, Section 8. We need to pay careful attention to that. It took the founding generation 14 years to get 
from the point where they were saying what they did not want out of their federal government to get to the point where they were saying what they did want, and they arrived at that in 1787. The good news is that it doesn't have to take us 14 years to get from where we are now to, to, to the point where we can say what we do want out of our national government, because we've got that right here. Right here. But that doesn't mean that the change that we want to bring about will be instantaneous. We know that it won't. And it may well take us the better part of 14 years to get there. The important part is to remember that we can get there, and we must get there, and we will get there to return to something that is. I want to make very clear at the outset that none of us, uh, neither Senator DeMitt nor Senator Paul nor I, nor this caucus, purports to speak for the Tea Party movement. The movement is what it is. Far from a party, far from any single organization. It's an organically grown, spontaneous, nationwide, grassroots political phenomenon. The media has chosen to give us the name of, of Tea Party. And that's a quick shorthand reference to refer to something much broader. What we really feel is the need to strive towards something that I refer to as constitutionally limited government. The idea that the federal government is not all things to all people. The idea that what ought to be debated and enacted in the halls of Congress should include not where we go to the doctor and how we pay for it, but instead things like national defense, weights and measures, uh, 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 regulating trade between states and foreign countries, and those powers for which the states are particularly ill-equipped, and for which the federal government has been authorized to act. That's where our focus is. And as Rand Paul mentioned just a few minutes ago, it's having its effect. He mentioned the President's reference to the earmark ban that he's going to enforce with his veto pen. I want to mention another line from uh, the President's speech, where President Obama, arguably one of the most liberal presidents in the history of the United States of America, said millions of Americans are sacrificing much to live within their means. They deserve a government that does exactly the same thing. Yeah. senators or 100. We've invited them all. I hope they'll all join us. If they don't, we're happy to hear your concerns. We will listen to you and we'll do everything we can to fight on your behalf to restore constitutionally limited government. Yeah. Yeah.